welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming and taking uh, four hours today with me to take a look at the at the Eagleford. Before we get into any of that, I'd like to I won't say correct, but modify. Um, I, in in the world of geology, I don't think you ever really discover anything. Everything's been. I'm going to have a slide here. In fact, I think who actually discovered the Eagleford. I don't, I'm not taking that credit. There's a lot of great people that have been involved in this. I just happen to be one of the lucky ones that was. That was earlier than than many, but um, I don't I don't view it that way. <clears throat> okay, now the issue that I have with the slides here is that it's very unconventional because orange is now green and red is now black. So if we can if we can figure out how to do that transformation in our heads as we move forward, um, I'll be amazed because I'm going to be confused. So this stuff here is orange. And that's red, so for whatever that is. So thank you very much for joining me today, and we'll get on with it. I'm going to have four pieces to the presentation today. One is that I'm a big fan of history, and I do believe that we are in a golden age right now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what comprises a golden age, but it makes it a very special time, and I think it's important to understand where you are in order to be able to understand where you're going. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on something called innovative prospecting. And basically all it is is a take on disruptive technology that um, uh, Christensen, uh, Clayton Christensen came up with back in the 90s. But this is an application to the oil and gas business. It's been highly reviewed in Harvard Business Journal. You go there once a month or every other month, there'll be a paper on disruptive innovation, disruptive technology. But I'm going to try to put this, frame it up into an oil and gas perspective because that's, those are tools that, that I was using by accident before I realized that they actually had a real name. And then after that, what I want to do is just share a few slides on the Eagleford, not to, uh, um, <clears throat> to use it as an example, I guess, because it's my sense that there's still a lot more of these. And that's why I've started two companies, because there are a lot more of these, and I'm chasing several right now. And they're only limited by the way we can process information and uh, think. And that's where the innovative prospecting and some of the other things I'm going to talk about come into play. And then lastly, everyone wants to know where the next big thing is. And of course, this paper was first given in Singapore. I've only given it once before. Um, and in Singapore, the reason why I was so excited to do it there was they don't have one scintilla of unconventional gas production in uh, Southeast Asia right now. And yet, at the AAPG um, International Convention, where I was the uh, chair for the Energy Minerals Division, the plenary session it was the second biggest ice ever. And the plenary session, which had 60% uh, of everyone, was on unconventionals. And so, the next big thing, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's an amazing thing. How is that possible? You get that kind of attention. So here we are in the first, the first part, the golden age. I'm an art fan, and so one of the things, I've got a little painting up here, and it's, I'll talk about that in just a second. But there's a couple key elements to a golden age. And again, what I want to do is frame up where we are right now so that we can get an idea of where we're going. So always, you always need to know where you start. Whether it's the Renaissance or the Dutch spice trade or the Industrial Revolution or the Anacline theory, whatever, there's, there's, these golden ages are fascinating to me because they're generally relatively brief, contextually brief periods of innovation and radical discovery. And they just kind of come out of nowhere. They're very unpredictable. Hence uh, Duran's picture of the, uh, the jungle here. You just never really know what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of risk. It's, everything's new. Everything's different. These are very cyclical. We all about golden ages and silver ages and bronze ages. Well, the important thing is these are cyclical. And so on the front end, if you can understand what you're in, that's when you get a disproportionate amount of the bang for your buck. That's like you look at the anticline theory and who really cleaned up and how all the companies were made. Well, we've got something like that going on in these things we call shales right now. They move the needle. What I'm going to talk about um, 
next is I'm going to be focusing in on this innovation and discovery. I'm not going to get into the cyclicity. I'm not going to get into the moving the needle, really. We all know most of that stuff, frankly. What I want to talk about is the disruptive uh, part of this, disruptive innovation or disruptive technology. So golden age and shales. Okay, so what's up with that? I just mentioned the ICE program. It just blows my mind. And you got 800 people or something, 1,200 people at this plenary session, and there's not even a molecule of unconventional gas produced in Southeast Asia, and yet it was packed. I mean, that's, that's something special. There's something going on here. So we're in a golden age. And I've already talked about the early mover advantage. And we've all seen this tired slide with um, EIA. This is a, actually 2010. They published it in 12. You know, what shale gas is like doing. We've seen this a million times. So I don't want to beat this up. But basically, who to thunk here? And we all know the story. So, And these colors are all screwed up. And... Okay, so now we're going to get into pretty, pretty much the meat of what I want to try to deliver to you. I want to try to leave you with at least a couple tools that you can use moving forward. That's, even, that's not even readable. So it's basically Wallace Pratt's 1952, very famous, uh, where uh, oil is found first uh, in the minds of men or humanoids or whatever we are. And then lastly, the, there's another quote that I really love. And we can see that one, please. And it's uh, Edward St. Gregorii. And this was a fascinating dude. 1937, he um, discovers vitamin C. He's a Hungarian guy, just a brilliant guy, self-made man. Um, he spent decades writing about thinking, discovery, innovation, way before any, anyone else. And I just love this. Discovery consists of seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what nobody's thought. So how do we get into that space? Well, talk about it. Oil's found in the minds of men, blah, blah, blah. What's the toolbox to do that? And he spent decades working on that. I'm going to share a little bit of that, and then those ideas have been further refined since. So without turning this into a psychology class, because I want to giddy up to what we really want to talk about, but I just want to set the stage a little bit on something called the reticular activating system. And basically what it is, it's the system within your brain that sensitizes you to what you pay attention to and also is responsible for your sleep wake cycles. So <clears throat> I'm getting this just a little bit more. Basically what it means is you find what you're looking for. We all know this. I mean, the other day I made some waffles. I got this really cool waffle maker and I paid a fortune for it. It's really hot and it's heavy and it's a pain to clean. Get on my, I got my magic mix. I get it all together. Waffles come out. I'm looking for my maple syrup. You know, the little maple syrup comes in a little jug, real maple syrup, not that stuff, a little glass thing, a little handle on the side. I go in the pantry. It's not there. I'm going, oh my God, this is horrible. I got my, my, this is a fantastic thing. I don't have my maple syrup. My wife goes, Paul, it's right in front of you. Well, I couldn't find it. She came, got it. It was right in front of me. It was in a different bottle. It was in a white bottle, and I had a little maple leaf on it or something. But it was sitting right in front of me. That was just a classic example, and I was thinking, my gosh, we all do this. Now, if we think in the professional sense, we all have an idea of what we're looking for. We're so focused we, that we know what it is. We know what we're looking for. We need to understand that that's what's really going on. That there you go. It's very important. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's found in the minds of... <laughs> it right yeah, it was right in front of us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We planned that. Brilliant. We planned that. Wow. Okay. Well, we did find that. Okay. Now, the other thing is that having worked for major companies, uh, the one thing is that, man, everyone's an expert. Everyone's an expert. And I just love this quote by Arthur Clarke. I don't know if you probably heard Arthur Clarke's uh, name before. Arthur Clarke wrote, uh, he was a uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. He also came up with a geostationary satellite system for ground communications in 1945. He's a, uh, just a crazy guy, but um, a great quote from him. Okay, so without, again, beating this up too much, basically if you're stressed out or you're, you, know, you can't wait to get your waffle or whatever, the, what you see and how you react is going to be very much a function of what your personal state is at the time and then what your priorities are. If you hate your job 
and you're, yeah, well, you're not going to really be that, be that productive. If you're really jazzed about it and you just sleep on it and you can't wait, there's a lot more going on within this particular activating system. I'm going to drive this a little bit more in just a minute. Bottom line is, and again, this is work done by our uh, space cadet, uh, um, uh, Miller. And Miller was a offshoot from um, Elvis Zagoria. He took his concepts, I say space shot, because he came up with this really radical stuff. And we're going to talk about it in a little bit. But basically the key was that he figured out, and he did this uh, empirical testing with people, that you can train yourself, if you're aware of how you think and how you're doing, so you can train yourself to use this powerful tool. We're going to just touch on it briefly. So he came up with this crazy thing called 7 plus or minus 2. This is wild, huh? It's like my socks. I got these socks and I got a little brain and there's five things because I've only got five. Seven plus or minus two means that, that the working memory can only hold, and this is a genetic thing, between five and nine chunks of information at the time. It's like chewing gum and walking. We can all, we can all do that because that's only two things. But you know, five, five to seven, this is discovered empirically. So we call it seven plus or minus two. So, Fine, that's a, who cares? This is where it's important. That what he discovered was that you can think about it like uh, co-processors. Your brain's a co-processor. Co-processor. So if you have one processor or five or ten and everything, they're going simultaneously. It becomes an exponential connections that you're making. But the important thing is that you got the processors and they're built in, but but now you can change the RAM. And you change the RAM through knowledge, expertise, education, becoming an expert, and learning more about it, or being passionate about it. So you can process larger chunks. And if you're working with five to seven and nine in your mental space, and the chunks get bigger and bigger, you can start to make connections that are brand new. And that's the exciting thing. That's how we found vitamin C. And, but the bottom line, and this is where the real message is, and again, this is from their dual work, um, your, your subconscious you know, is doing a million things all the time. So if you can get your passion around it, and you can get your education, and you surround yourself with the right people, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But man, it's a heck of a powerful tool. Okay, so, so what's the, how do you do it? It's real simple. I'm going to talk about. But I want to try to boil this down into something that you know you can take away and say, well, okay, a lot of stuff I don't know, but that kind of makes sense. Focus on results, and you can. I can give you tons of literature on this, and you can read it until you're, you know, drinking a bottle of wine with me or something. But um, focus on results facilitates discovery. I'm going to flesh this out. But as I say here, we're getting back to the experts. There are all these experts everywhere. You know. John Masters is my hero. I kind of fashioned my career after him when I started in the late 70s at Chevron. But, you know, you must have the rarest talent of all to convert information into action. Because, you know, you have data, and then you have information, and then you have action. You know, action is real hard to do. And so, you do all this great stuff, but if you just sit there and say, well, I thought about that. Someone else will, that doesn't do you any good. So, part of it is a toolbox I'm going to talk about on turning your idea into something that is real. So I call this ACB. Okay, so the discovery process is basically in my mind, and I'm going to have to make this so that I can understand because I'm a pretty simple guy. There's a discovery process that we're all familiar with, and I call it ABC. We all learn this, and it's, it's, a, it's a great tool. We, everyone uses it. And this is how we're brought up. I mean, this is, the, this is how we were... Uh, how we came out of the jungle, out of uh, Dure's uh, jungle there. Um, you start with the questions, the issues, and then you go into, okay, now that's fine, now how do I do it? And then finally you go, okay, well, I got the question, this is the how, I got the result. Boom. What's next? That's what we do, and it's darn good. ACB, now you flip it around. You start with the same, start in the same point. You go to the result. And now you have this thing called teamwork and iteration. I mean, my gosh, we hear about it all the time. But this is where the money is. So 
the similarities in these two modes, you know, like I said, you all start with A. That's easy. The differences. Now, the, the deal with the scientific method is that it assumes that your initial issues or questions are relevant to the result. What if they don't even make any difference for the result? That what you think you know, even it may be right, it may be wrong, in a great reading on what you think you know, and right or wrong is John Crosscoff, 1959, Tale of Ten Plutons. It was an uh, address at the uh, GSA. Unbelievable. Professor of Stanford, beautiful on what you think you know and what's real and stuff like that as geologists. Just great reading. But, but what if your preconceptions are not in line? How are you going to find what you think you're looking for? You get a brick wall. Okay, so if we flip to a different space. Now, okay, we're going to go back to whatever we were talking about before with uh, the reticular activating system and the, you know, the 7 plus or minus 2. How does all this stuff fit in? Okay, you've got 7 plus or minus 2 and you're, you've got these chunks of information and you're learning more and more about this stuff. And you've got all of these uh, connections going and you're starting to reframe things. And, and I'm going to give a couple examples of it. And you come to, well, boy, what if we could do something like this? And you have no idea how you're going to get there. But through all this, all this other information, you go, well, geez, it seems like that should work. I don't know how it can work, but based on this and this and this. So, what are the keys? We all know about this. One of the keys is, one of the keys of the keys is this resilience. I'm going to talk about that. I mean, this is, this is tough. Learning on the fly, this is tough. In the old days, we were, as professionals, we were, uh, it was all about, knowledge, experience, and skill, <clears throat> okay? That's what it was, you had a whole career. Things have changed. And there's, the knowledge is important, you get on the internet. The experience, there's case studies all over the place. I'm not downgrading experience, the experience is very, very important. But what hasn't changed is the skill. We all have certain skills that we are exceptional. And it's discovering what that skill is and then that specific skill, and then designing around that. And that's learning on the fly. Once you have that, you start sucking up things that are applicable to this to work in your 7 plus or minus 2. But the resilience, you know, John Leinhardt, I don't know if any of you guys ever listened to NPR. I used to when I gave up the subscription because I couldn't stand the politics anymore. But I used to love his thing on Fridays when he had the creativity thing, innovation thing. He did it every Friday morning. It was awesome. And he has a great paper on resilience. Then how if you really, people talk about innovating. And, um, if you really want to do that, you've got to be a little different. You've got to be resilient. You've got to be able to get, like, you've got to get the slings and arrows because you're going to be talking about things that are crazy sometimes. You know, that's just not right. And so if you're not going to be comfortable in that space, some of this stuff isn't going to work. So this is what I just gave you the warning sign right here. You are in uncharted territory in convention, man. Convention is everything. I mean, God, we did that. We know that. You know, you know, when you come up with something different, just expect that, and that's a, that's okay. That's okay. But masters, masters again is my hero. This is the, you know we got a lot of hard things going on here, but. The mental discipline. You know, you can dream up all this crazy stuff, but it could still be garbage. So you have to be your own worst critic. You have to be constantly subjecting yourself to, okay, now how can I shoot this down? What's wrong with this? You know, you've got to be able to, one of the things that John Lehar talks about is that to be able to do this effectively, you have to be able to operate with two different, two different sets of emotions in your head. You have, to be, you have to be able to say, well, Jesus, I don't really know, and I'm going to bounce back and forth between these two because you get this dynamic tension, and that's how you stretch out the 7 plus or minus 2. That's my interpretation anyway. Okay, so now we're going to do something that's um, just an example. Well, let's just say, since I did this thing in Southeast Asia, and I worked there for a number of years when I started the Conoco's International Unconventional Group, um, I figured we'd do something on that. Everyone's in 
Singapore, they're all meeting and having this plenary about unconventional stuff. There's no plays. So let's have an example. And I got my little uh, dollar sign there. We're in a resource triangle. We're kind of looking for stuff, but we're not at the top. We're down here somewhere, and God only knows where. And in Southeast Asia, they're not even on the triangle. No one even knows it exists yet because there's nothing that's happened. But let's just say that Southeast Asia, you want to find a liquids rich play. It's tertiary, because most of the rocks are tertiary. It's everything's my, my C, my C, my C, and all that stuff. And you're going to end up with uh, very often tertiary stuff, because that's what most of the systems are, or a lot of the systems are. OK, so in that system, again, there's no place there right now. In these, uh, in these rocks, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Southeast Asia, but uh, there's a lot of clay. And conventional logic. And it's conventional logic is just that. So we're talking A, B, C space. Is that, boy, you get clay, and reservoir poly, you know, you can only have 40% clay, you can only have whatever the number is. We all got the secret sauce. I'm going to talk about secret sauce in a little bit. Frackability, well, it's easy. Put that stuff in there, and Young's is going to be in the toilet, and, you know, Poisson's. Oh, geez, it's just, it's not, and then, you know, you're propping it in it, you know, roller oven. Oh, my gosh, horrible. It's just, you're not going to keep it open. Forget it. You got the clay, can't work. Okay, too much clay. Let's just say another potential issue is that you're not reflecting. So by that, I mean more like maturity indicator, because a lot of the things in Southeast Asia are barely in the oil window, and they wouldn't even be that because unless you had the high heat flow, you know, because my assume, but you're in that really tectonically active area. Um, but it vitriated reflectance through maturity. So, gosh, a lot of the stuff is it's it's um, it's not terribly mature. You're not in a gas. You got lower viscosities. Uh, you don't really have any. Rarely do you have really an overpressure other than this uh, compactual disequilibrium. You don't have some of these key things that you really want from the, because of the lack of maturity. And then lastly, on rock mechanics, where I talked about some of this stuff, but you know, hole integrity and compaction. So these are the problems. So, okay, so let's say an example. Let's just say, God, yeah, we know all that, and there's a lot more, I mean, there's all kinds of problems, but. We really want to see if we can find this. And we know a few things about these plays. So we're going to try to recapitulate, reconstruct uh, this and think about it in a different way. So we start with the uh, same issues. Just in a, this is just a hypothetical, but OK. We've already talked about this, you know, about the issues. So, well, gosh, there's a million reasons why it can't work. And believe me, I ran into that at companies that I work for. So that's crazy. I can't possibly. And that's it. They may be wrong. Okay. So now we're in C space and we're going, well, geez, what if? Okay. Boy, there's a lot of oil that's been produced in those rocks. And man, you look at that darn resource triangle. And if we're up here, there's got to be a bunch down here. How do we get it out? Or gas or whatever you're looking for. It's still there. Okay. So. This, these are really, these aren't just arbitrary questions. If you want to read um, um, Clayton Christensen in uh, 2012 in Harvard Business Review came out with it, just a, he called it, uh, I think it was Disruptive Innovation, a great, great paper. Basically, these are the key questions. These are the key questions. You surround yourself with the right people, you start asking these types of questions like, why? Michael Dell started Dell, Dell by, with the question, why? He was a computer geek, and he got a computer. He couldn't understand at the time why a computer cost three thousand dollars. That's a long time ago. It's a lot of money. And he was a computer geek. He used to take them apart. He could. He, could, he said, "Well, geez, I take it apart, and it only takes six hundred dollars to make one." That's how we started his company. Because of why? He said, "Well, geez, I can do that, and I can do it for a lot less than three thousand dollars." But he started with why. So you surround yourself with people. You do this interaction. We've all we've all heard a million times about this stuff. You, you know, there's a lot of motivational speakers. You enjoy it. Then you get you start to get in here and go, well, geez, maybe what if rather than a clay issue, what if we're going for a hybrid reservoir? You know, we got a bunch of clay in it, but then we got these turbidetic lenses, and some of those lenses are pretty darn awesome. And the fleece, they're 2,200 meters, and you got these incredible everything's hydrocarbon saturated, unbelievable. Maybe you could go in with a, uh, you know, uh, uh, open packer type system, and you don't try to give it a conventional completion. You try something a little bit different with a hybrid type of a system, and then maybe on the um, on the immaturity, 
Well, one of the things is that um, there's a lot of temperature variations in the bottom hole, temperature gradient, you know, thermal gradient in Southeast Asia. So if you've got an immature system, use heat flow maps. I mean, in the, uh, uh, North America, SMU's got a terrific heat flow map for the entire continent. And you can see where the Eagle Fur is. You can see where a lot of the places are just from looking at that map. It's been out forever. You go on Google Earth, they finally got a thing, you get it free on Google Earth. Now you had to pay a fortune in the old days, but you know that it's just a little company. We can't afford to buy anything, so you've got to get them cheap. Um, and then on the completion. So you start to say, well, geez, maybe if we frame this up, we just think about it different, then maybe we might have a plan. Maybe. That's it. It's that simple. So, okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about secret sauce. These, these, are, these are killer examples. And you've all heard about them. Okay. Jake, I ran into Dr. J here. Dr. J and I used to be with Burlington in the day back in... You know, the 90s, we worked cold dead methane. He's Mr. Cold dead methane. I'm late. I, I got in that way after he did. But um, but we all knew, right, Jay, that, hey, man, you're looking for another CN130 and 6, right? I mean, it had to have overpressure. And this is the secret sauce. It had to be thick. You know, it's 30 foot or 40 foot thick. And it didn't have a lot of water. If you didn't have a lot of water, you didn't have a lot of permeability. You couldn't cavitate it, blah, blah, blah. So, gosh, for the next 10, 15 years, Everyone's looking for this, you know, for that stuff. But they didn't find it. That was a secret. Find one of those. There's only one place that anyone's found something similar to this, and Jay would know more about it than I, but Fairview Field in the Surratt Bowling. Um, it's kind of similar, but it took a long time to figure it out. But meanwhile, you know, for a long, long time, people were looking for something that didn't exist, but then they found these other things. Now, today we look back and we kind of let powder, you know. Back then, it's, it's big stuff, you know, drunkards wash. Uh, even in Raton, Raton Basin at El Paso, uh, when I started there, there was no production. And uh, three years later, we got it up to, I don't know, 850 bees. It's just because there was a different model. There were all these volcanic sills, and it was ugly, and the shale, and its coals were thin. It's just a little different thing. I mean, it was, just go where the resource is. So the other one, we all know about this. Gosh, this is my favorite. Back in the day when the barnet was taken off, everyone knew the recipe. And you got to have fractures, you know, the magic, thermal maturity. It's got to be gas. It's got to be gas. Shale, it's got to be gas. Silica, you know, cracks. You gotta, it's got to have fractures. It has to. It's a secret sauce in 2005. This is great. Then, you know, you started to get things are a little different, you know. It's like some of them are really, really much higher, some are lower. I mean, these are very different plays in their own way. And um, initially, they were not recognized because they didn't exactly fit the model. And they fit to varying degrees. You know, there's different elements, but they, didn't ex they weren't exact replicas. But then, we're going to go to sea space now, 2005. What if, what if you said, well, what's the opposite? You know, opposites attract. It, why does it really have to be fractured? Maybe you can turn it into sugar cubes. What about carbonates? I mean, carbonates are the biggest. I mean, you produce more hydrocarbons out of carbonate reservoirs than siliciclastics globally. Why not? Why can't it work? And then liquids are rich. That's where the money is. Maybe you think about that. There weren't a lot of people learning about that back then. So what I want to talk about is just a little brief Vignet on how this crazy idea at Burlington that started with what stupid white space and Carlos Rose said, Paul, you don't you don't even know what that is? I didn't know a damn thing about this. South Texas. Still don't really. Um, so we started here. I don't want to go through all this stuff because you guys know all this. Um, we started uh, when I started the company or the uh, group inside ConocoPhillips, I had a code name, Coat Door. Got to have it, you know, Golden Slope. And I called it Golden Slope, and people at um, kind of Phillips. I think a lot of them still don't even really know what the store it was, but we needed a code name because at the time we had this little fairway, this little fairway here that we had mapped out. It was about seven, eight miles wide, and I don't, I'm not going to get in all that, but basically uh, we wanted to be in a vapor phase, supercritical uh, fluid because we figured it'd be overpressure because there's no fracturing and low poissons and all that other stuff. But anyway, we had this thing, but we, it was all in lease, and we had all this green up here and the oil and the in the Austin and the Edwards down here, the gas, and Kotor went golden slope, and the, it was just a play on words. Because a giant, you know, elephant, Kotor, one guy, Burgundy, 
um, golden slope. Basically, it was where, we're at, where we were, I didn't want to be near any faults. Just a home climb. Just a home climb. So it's a golden slope. Jed clamp it up from the ground, come a bubbling crude. Why not? So just made up a stupid name. So we got that's a that's a chocolate made in Belgium. We used to have them. We had like in our team room and stuff. We had crazy things like that. So let's see. Familiar with all the fields and you know, all this stuff. In Singapore, they don't know this stuff. So, so this is where I was getting on this whole discovery thing. Okay, check this out. World Oil, 1978. The Eagle Ford Shale is full of oil in most locations in eastern South Texas counties. It's brittle, black shale. Black shale, what a great word. There have been some recent completions. Although by itself, it could not be considered a target. He was absolutely right. That was absolutely right. But this guy, he already discovered it, whoever it was. He already knew about it. Of course, we now know about you know, the horizontal drilling and the, you know, turning it into sugar cubes and all that stuff. So that's why no one's really, this stuff is, people knew about this a long time ago. So I'm going to talk briefly about this. I don't want to belabor it. Um, we've already talked about the model. We all know that. Quartz uh, dominated, and then, you know, we focused, focused on calcite. I already talked about that. Um, it's in 2000, this is a year and a half after we had the project going, but even in then, this is the fairway that we had. This is the acreage that Conoco has now, but you can see the number of wells that were actually in the fairway. And they're just, and they're old doggy wells, you know, so you had to kind of look at one side, look at the other side, and then kind of extrapolate in between. And there were some old beat ups, 2D seismic, and I, the key was I just didn't want to be near any faults. And that was really kind of first. You go, gosh, there's no fractures, and it's, you know, you don't want to be near faults? What's up with that? You know, in Austin, you know, you got to be near faults. Come on, you got to, it's got to be fractured up. So, this was the thought process on, you know, the 7 plus or minus 2 to get to the result and say, well, geez, how do we get to the result? This is what was kind of spinning in the background here. Well, I worked West Africa for a while. I worked a little bit around in, in the world. And, man, the Tronian's hard to beat. And I got on the Internet, you know, data pages and found out something called the Eagle for the Tronian. Oh, that's good. The Tronian's good. Um, you know, and I figured, you know, you all know it's at least a partial source. And, you know, it's got all the shows and all that stuff. And we've already talked about the carbonates. And, this was, this was a concept, but I figured that it's going to be very overpressured just because it's not fractured. And it's generating right now based on, well, that was just, the other thing that we were talking about was cracking uh, gas to oil. And that was, kind of the folks had a research group and said, well, yeah, that can happen. But, you know, and I said, well, geez, you know, maybe it's going on here. You know, we've already talked about the home line and, ah, this is the other thing. The secret sauce recipe in the Barnett, it's a long time ago, and we forget what it is. It used to be what everyone knew, and what we all knew it was not the right stuff. But if you recall, in the Barnett, there was a period of time when people said 80% of the gas is at its work. Go back. We've all forget now because we're all so smart. 80%, and it was 50%, and it got lower and lower and lower. Well, this play, from the very beginning, it was so damn hot. Our bottom hole temperature is like 280 to 320, 330. Well, I mean, you've got to be a genius. Dr. J knows this. You've got to keep bringing up J, but we're talking about absorption. No one knows more about it than him. That boy, when you, you, know, you look at um, you know, the um, uh, Van der Waals forces and stuff that goes on, when you get the temperature so high, you're browning in motion, and you're not going to have any sort of gas. And everyone said, well, geez, oh, this play can't work because you know, it's going to be too hot. You're not going to have any absorption gas. And look at this. This is a shale. You can't have enough porosity in it. So the idea was that, well, we're going to have a compression gas play. And if there's porosity on there, because we didn't know, we didn't have any good modern logs, then we're going to have a hell of a play because it's so hot. It's so deep. And the other things we wanted to focus, we ran some numbers focusing on, the, we all know this now, but this was um, kind of crazy back then. Was, the whole idea was a supercritical fluid. Uh, Non-Newtonian fluid, and it's a lot. The viscosity is a lot lower, higher pressure. It'll move through the ugly rocks better, and you get a better recovery factor and higher rate. And the other thing was that in 2005, we had this crazy idea to map this uh, thick behind the uh, San Marcos Arch here, and uh, there was a well that Burlington drilled right there, and it was the Cundy number one, and it was taken at Nape. It was a word field analog back reef, 
And they take it down, and it, you know, it wasn't any good. But I got on my knee pads and got Burlington to cut some core on the way down in the Eagleford. I don't know, I don't know what they were thinking, but um, got the core back. It was like 200 bees per 640 and 400 uh, barrels a million yield. But man, this is here. This is, I mean, this is real data. This isn't just Pazinski totally waving his arms. So we had a data point there in 2005. That's when things, I got really excited. That's it. Burlington, and Burlington's best company I ever worked for, well, Conoco Phillips was, but I love working for Burlington, but they said, man, you can't get that out of the ground. How can you get that out of the ground? It's not fractured. People drill through it. You're saying it's overpressured. They have normal pressured mud. It's a limestone. What the heck? I said, well, turn it into sugar cubes. I don't know. I'm just a challenge. It's easy for me to say that. Heck, I don't know. Bust it up. Who knows? So, anyway. I've already talked about that. And so that was kind of the sea space and what was behind the sea space. And that was the leasehold in 2008. And by the way, um, I'm going to get to it, but we actually had two different plays. This was the Eagleford play, and then this was an Austin play, Austin truck play. I'm going to talk a little bit why we did that. Okay, and of course we all know there's a zillion wells in the trend there, and I guess there's a zillion wells. Oh yeah, yeah. We picked up a whole bunch of acreage too. It's like, I think our net, our net was um, two fifty with about thirty bucks brokerage. So, okay. So we talked before about everyone's gonna say you're crazy. Well, that's fine. You're right. You're fine. So this is some of the feedback, and, and and the point is, this isn't about Brzezinski waving flag. It's about this is what you can expect, and this is this is good. This is good because then you have to think through it and say, because you have to keep these two opposing dialogues going on in your mind. You know they're right. So how the heck can that really work? How can I justify that to myself and then build the case? Because at Conical Phillips, after I became the Eastern U.S. Exploration Manager, I told them, hey, I got a little project. And they said, what? But, it, you know, six months later, I got through the global chiefs. Because if you can't answer all these questions, you, know, you have to at least have a probable answer. You can't have an answer, but you have to have a logical answer. So if you haven't gone through this process, I talked before about at the end of the day you have a great idea, but how do you get it done? You are doing this dynamic um, tension where you're really trying to tear it apart. Because if it doesn't work, like Master said, the hardest thing, but it's what you gotta do, you gotta kill it before anyone else. So yeah, fractures, we already talked about this. And it's too young, too hot, too deep, it's so expensive. Um, you know, you can't have liquid. Yeah, back then it was, boy, boy, you're going to get condensate banking. Even this thing works, you're going to get condensate banking, and it's going to kill your permeability, and it's too soft. And we all learned in school that it's limey stuff. It's not like dolomite. You get it hot. You know, it's kind of compliant. It's not going to frack real well. Um, and then you're talking about, oh, geez, you know, 200 bees and 400, and it's open for 250 miles. Or, that's crazy. You know, how the hell is that? It's been drilled through how many times, and everyone's missed it? You know, that rock can't produce. We gave the rock to um, some really, really, really good uh, carbonate petrologists and petrophysicists, and um, it was uh, $300,000. And it came back about, I wish I had the report, it came back and this was the conclusion. <laughs> I loved it. So that was helpful. <laughs> so there you go. That's you. Um, as you, as you fishing line right there, so you're ready to go fishing. You know, it's, this is just, you're, it's just hopeless, right? But here's the good news. Every one of these things, when you're doing these kinds of projects, in my experience is you've got to listen. You've got to really use these because that's great input, great input, because those are valid concerns. So how is it that you can figure out and you can convince someone else that there's an alternate explanation, kind of like we showed with Southeast Asia? You know, with the issues. What's another logical, possible way that it can be? That's where the value in the space is. So, so where you get the other stuff I was talking about, 7 plus 1 is 2. And then at the end of the day, even if you can explain it all, then you got to figure out how can you sell it? you got to sell it. So what did we do? I showed you on the map. We had two different plagues. Well, because we had the... Um, the Austin Chalk, of course, everyone knows Deep Giddings. This is just a down, just an extension along uh, Strike. In fact, uh, Ardent, we're, we're back by First Reserve, 
but another company that's backed by First Reserve is NFR, and I'm cribbing with them right now um, in some of their office space, and they just bought the Austin chalk acreage that we had picked up for ConocoPhillips way back when, and they're making a go of it. But the, this was kind of a, con, it was an unconventional, but it was a conventional play, and it was part of the trend, but then with that, we could do this, because they said, well, you know, okay, and then, you know, okay, maybe that's a flyer, but yeah, we'll go for it. If it would just been Eagle for no way, no way. And heck, we didn't know which one was going to work. I had no idea. None of us knew if it was, maybe both of them would work, but having two is a lot better than having one. We don't know that. So, I'm going to get through here. This is really key. You know, being passionate and I've talked a little bit about having people that aren't, they're afraid. You're going to engage and you're going to try stuff. Having heretics, I call them heretics, I love heretics. Heretics are great. Um, we were very fortunate. Conical Phillips was awesome. They, you know, they let us alone. We had our own team room. No one could go in there. You had a pass card code name. Bosses, Jim Mulva couldn't get into the name room. We were a little, little skunk works. And they supported us the whole way. It was, I don't know why, they were crazy, but they did. And we were able to pick some of the best people, hand pick them for our team. Ben, that's a deep bench. That was nice. And they were able to keep it secret. I mean, it was, we kept it secret for several, even within the company, there were people that didn't know about this project two years later because if people would have found out, we were afraid it was going to be gone. You know, we didn't know if it was even going to work, but the last thing you wanted to do was let it out of the bag. And the, uh, we all know this now, we're having a stage pilot program, but we didn't just go out and lease. You know, you're not going to get a major company to do something stupid like that. You've got to do a step at a time, and you get your critical data, and you, you know, you, but you've got to keep it quiet, and you get some land, and you, but you've got to kind of stage the whole thing. So you have to have, you know, land working with the, you know, the, you know all the folks and a big company that takes, you know, a lot of communication and stuff. And we all know about this, outlining uh, the, Leasing was really important. But at the end of the day, I think one of the things that set our team apart, and we're having a reunion on our team in a, I think about a, two or three weeks, and was having fun. I mean, we just, we were crazy. We had flying monkeys. We had all kinds of things. We created our own little culture. And man, that, you want to get passionate with people, and you want to be able to do something a little bit different, that makes all the difference in the world. It really does. We had, our, we had it was just a lot of fun. And, and we can all do that. We can do that every day if we want so I'm glad we can see this. I, uh, I'm a wine lover. I love wine. And Reynolds' Persistence is a great wine. I really like that stuff. But on the back, there's a quote from Calvin Coolidge. And Calvin Coolidge, I mean, I what a loser. But, um, but I love this quote. I'm not going to bother reading it. But it talks about the persistence. You know, you know, you can be the smartest guy in the room. At the end of the day, especially when you're trying to do what we're doing, what we're talking about doing, you have to be really persistent. You got to keep trying to tear it down. You got to be the first one to kill it. But man, if you can keep doing that and you don't give up, that's where the money is. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through any of this. We're done with that. So the next big thing. Well, okay, fine. Who cares about that? What's next? We talked a little bit about about um, Southeast Asia, and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger, like the rest of the world, and talk about it. Um, think about it. Whether we like it or not, and we should like it because this is awesome, we have a heck of a laboratory here in the U.S. We have figured out, I mean, we're leading the world, and we should be. But we also have to understand that our laboratory is, is geologically biased. I mean, back, I mean, basically, it's mostly, mostly Paleozoics. Um, we've got, obviously, Tronian and, and Ibrera and some other things you know, now, but... Um, it's largely still Paleozoic. Yet, the majority of the world's production is post Paleozoic. We talked about that in Southeast Asia. That's my gosh. Um, marine. Jeez, how many customer places do we have in the U.S.? Show by about the Green River in the bottom of the U.N. And it's working pretty good, but the problem is usually it's not mature enough and blah, blah, blah. And you, know, you got paraffin and you got all kinds of issues. but. But the best source rocks, I mean, you know, we're, we're West Africa. My gosh, the Bukamazi, that's like the best damn source rock there is. You look at the stuff in Uganda, oh man, that's rocking. It's all lacustrine. Lacustrine, lacustrine, lacustrine. Yet, 
you know, in the, in the, in the states, no, restaurant, oh, man, that just can't work, you know. Well, we, we, I don't think we've really, we've really pulled our, all of our arrows out of the quiver. I mean, there's, there's, I love high, high hydrogen index rocks. I mean, they've got other issues, but it's hard, hard to go wrong. We've already talked about this. Um, another interesting thing, and the next big thing is, and if you, if you look at these um, large international plays, like offshore Vietnam, there's a really cool, called White Tiger, it's fractured granite. It's just a cool field, uh, sitting on top of a bunch of Miocene shale. And, uh, Cardinal Phillips had a Sudan field, and there's one TCF per well, producing out of fractured granite with 2,200 feet of talise of shale sitting on top of it. That's all over pressure. That's never even had a test in it before. I mean, my gosh, just sitting right there. I mean, someone ran a DST in the talise at 2,200 meters thick. It's got these, it's a hybrid play. Uh, yeah, I think it was like four million a day and a thousand barrels. You know, it was just DST. You know, I mean, my gosh, there's so much out there. Um, but it's you know, it's, it's, it's uh. so. I believe that man, there's a lot more out there still, but we just have to um, reconsider our secret sauce recipes, and that masters, again, he's my hero, but. This is back in 76. The next big oil will be in fields that have been invisible. You're crazy. You got the, you got the, the fishing lure things on your ears, you know, but they've been invisible. So the how is, you know, you, we have to know what's going on in the laboratory. We have to be, con we, it's imperative, but, but we don't stop there. That's where we start. And we take the secret sauce recipes and then using the 7 plus or minus 2 and our passion and interaction with others, we rearrange it. We start to rearrange it in ways that, well, what about this? And you, and you start to work inter interactively out, out of sea space. And I think that if you embrace this, you are going to be able to sh share some incredible success. Because this, the, the golden age is still with us. But man, people, we are. There's a lot of velocity in this industry. And we figure it out fast. But there's still a little bit of room, and that's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, believe me, I'm no Einstein, I'm about the opposite, but I just love this. Uh, logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Hey, let's go. So, with that, gosh, it wasn't even four hours. <laughs> how to do the completions. First of all, without getting into the weeds, it's very important to make sure you have sufficient resource concentration. And we can talk about that offline a little bit. But then you also have to have, to have the right mechanical properties of the rock. So I'd say if you have the right resource concentration and the right mechanical properties from the completion side, that's what I'd be looking for. If you're, if you're, it depends what play you want to look at. If you're looking at doing the exploration side of it, and again, it's pretty. This, these tracks are pretty well worn now. But it was all about um, it was all about finding uh, prospecting with poor pressure gradient because there was an indication of the degree of cracking, and the degree of cracking because you're in a vapor phase. You know that's the key. And in a vapor phase, if you just look at compositional kinetics when you're in a vapor phase, you don't get much C1 and C2. I think it's not worth anything right now. You don't really get much. It's not like migrated oil when you get gas that's in solution. When you look at these vapor phase. They're really rich in the types of stuff that we like, which is you know the heavier C6s. So even your gas is real high BTU content. 
So those would be, you know, those are the two turn off the top. One more question, anybody out there? You can, uh, oh, Donna, quickly. One, uh, the Egyptians did it the same way too, hence the bent pyramid changing <coughs> sloping mid-construction. And the question is, uh, how much of an acid are the volcanic plastics in Southeast Asia going to be uh, in the uh, reservoirs? Okay. Um. Yeah, um, boy, again, a very broad question. Um, um, I, I hate to use this word, but I think it's just going to depend because there's places, like in Sarawak, there's an area where actually they're going to be your best friend. So it just kind of depends on it. is it recycled or, you know, I mean, and what's the composition of it and the diagenesis and stuff like that. I, I don't think you should run when you see them. I mean, that's the only thing that I would say. You, know, you just got to start asking different questions. All right, uh, we've got to get back to work here, most of the people. So just before we all take off, I want to take this chance to uh, say thanks, Paul. What a, what a great talk, good takeaways. I think Tony Robbins would have got something out of this as well uh, if he sat here. So it's a combination of science and uh, sociology, and that's, that's yeah. what it's all about. Um, as uh, a token of our gratitude, we pr we're going to present you with a little award. And for a guy who likes rocks um, <laughs> and sees the, the specialness of different types of rocks, this is a Carrera marble from Italy, ah. Jurassic in age. And it's the rock that Michelangelo used to use when he got uh, visions of grandeur, as well as the Romans <laughs> in the bath. So okay. again, on behalf of the Thank HGS, you. thanks a lot, Paul. Everybody, thanks have a good Thank you. I bet you this has got more permeability than most of our shales. <laughs> <laughs> it's a source <laughs> Thank you.